The City of Pembroke Pines and the Frank C. Ortis Art Gallery are pleased to present Conversations with the Curator, a discussion program featuring prominent curators, gallery directors, exhibition coordinators, and more. Conversation topics will include each curator's career development story, advice to artists for exhibition proposals, favorite exhibition concepts, and endearing behind the scenes anecdotes. On behalf of the City of Pembroke Pines and the Frank C. Ortis Art Gallery, I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Megan Kent. Megan Kent is the Curator of Exhibitions at the Art and Culture Center Hollywood in Florida. She's the founder of Site95, an organization that holds exhibitions in available spaces, including Locust Projects and public outdoor spaces in Miami and New York. As a gallery director for the past 15 years, she's managed the careers of internationally emerging and established artists and coordinated exhibitions locally and worldwide. Megan completed her MA in Art History at George Washington University, Washington, D.C., and her BA at the College of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Her exhibitions have been reviewed in the Washington Post, the Miami Herald, the New York Times, to name a few. So this conversation aims to give our listeners a more intimate view of who you are as a curator and an individual. So let's get personal. I'd love you to tell me about yourself as a child or as a teen, and I'd love to know what the early signs of your love of the arts were. Okay, well, thank you so much, Taryn. It is a pleasure to speak with you. And I was always really interested in art and art history growing up. I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia outside DC. And so the National Gallery was was right there for me. And so I have a lot of really young, you know, experiences being around fine art and really appreciating fine art. And then I studied art history in high school and it just was the one, it was really the one subject that grabbed my attention the most. I loved symbolism. I loved the way that you could communicate ideas um, through the use of symbolism and the way that you can um, send messages uh, through painting and through sculpture and, and through fine art. So it's always been with me. I'm not an artist but I mm-hmm. love being around artists. Uh, so when I was in college, I, I definitely had to take a lot of art classes. And, right. um, and I, I just really liked being around artists and making work with them, but really more paying attention to what they were doing. And so it, it became very natural for me to kind of go into this field of art history. And so that's, that's, something that I've always stuck with through high school, through college, through grad school. Um, And then I did uh, many, many internships. And so I'd say another kind of remarkable point was through some of those internships. So it does sound like you have a very unique story. I think that for a lot of creatives, um, curatorial work becomes something that is an option for them as a career, but not necessarily always their main passion in life. But um, from what you're saying, it sounds like it was something that was a focal point for you from the start. Yeah, I I wanted to be a curator. I wanted to study art history. I loved the idea of teaching and education. All of that really never changed. I would say looking at the field of curators, it's not what I had thought it would be when I was like in school and when I was, when I was growing up, but um, you know, the field of, of, in, of independent curators has grown so much and it does allow for people to transition back and forth. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've always thought artists are incredible curators. They have such a creative eye Absolutely. and I have, yeah, I, I've learned a lot working with artists and in, in through their eye that it's actually opened my eyes in a much wider way in the way that I curate and being more experimental than I probably would have had I gone down a very narrow path. Yeah. So I think it's nice that it can be fluid both ways. Um, I think it's great for artists or non- art historian scholars Mm -hmm. uh, to be experimenting and trying to to make exhibitions because they have a different perspective and in exhibition making than what somebody that has a very traditional background uh, might have and I've just been very fortunate to work with um, some really interesting people really experimental people that that kind of opened my lens. 
You know, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is um, across the board in many of the, you know, personal interviews that I've read of yours, you speak with so much respect about artists and creatives. And that's not always the case. So I really appreciate that in you. And I think that it's something that that like that artists are going to respond to in this area in South Florida very, very well. Oh, that's so nice. You know, I, I just love, uh, I love collaborating and I love working with people. I think I have gallery management behind my belt where I really worked 13 years in, in New York galleries where you were managing an artist's career. And so I have a lot of experience in how to help an artist grow their career. You know, I have that kind of experience and in, in being able to share that information. But also it's those relationships. When you work at a gallery, it's not just one show. You don't just finish the show and tuck it away and never see that person again. It's a it's a 10 year relationship. Like one of the galleries I worked at was five years and oh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm still in touch with those artists. You know, I worked with uh, three different artists for five years in New York and then I moved to Mexico and I worked with several of them again on different projects. So these relationships, were much uh, more close knit. And I think that may lend to why why you might notice that is that because these are these are real partnerships. And so, you know, another thing that I'm doing here is uh, through my nonprofit, you know, I did several projects with artists that were based here, and I've certainly reconnected with them. Two of mm -hmm. them working in a group, ex Christina Pedersen and Antonia Wright. I've worked with both of them, and I'm doing a project next year that they're going to be a part of. So I'm thrilled to work with them again. And I think there's there's a lot of people that kind of come in and out uh, of your life, and so you know, it's good to have really positive, growing experiences, and so that it can always those doors are always open. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So in terms of being able to, to foster these long-term relationships, um, I'd love to give some advice to our listeners who happen to be artists as well. What are some of the characteristics or habits that you find make it easy for you to, to work with artists? What are the types of personality traits or professional practices that make it easy to really keep that long-term relationship going between themselves and a curator? Wow. I've worked with so many different kinds of personalities in the art world. Like, oh my goodness. I'm sure. Um, and I have, yeah, I'm like, all of these crazy stories can come to mind. Like, oh my goodness, there's this one time um, but you know, usually when you're working with people, you understand that they have certain styles that work with, um, you know, these artists have these different styles that uh, methods of working that you can fold into and blend into your own, you know, process of exhibition making. So, you know, I've worked with people that are very diligent, um, that their work is very, very specific and very, um, you know, really thought out, really conceptually um, driven. And so things have to be just so. And so I've learned just along the years to work with people when they really are very clear with what the vision that they have and, and to be respectful for that. At the same time, I've worked with people that are super spontaneous and fluid and free. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's been incredibly wonderful too, is that then the project can kind of grow and evolve and you know, I've one of I'd say one of the best experiences is working with somebody on site and really having faith um, where we have faith in each other that it's going to work out and that it's going to look beautiful and that they appreciate my feedback. You know, I'm not a heavy handed curator. I lay out the ideas and, um, you know, but if somebody wants to hang something at a, you know, at a certain height or a certain width or whatever, I'm not going to you know, say, no, that's unacceptable. I'm, I'm going to be pretty fluid with them. But mm -hmm. if they're also open with me, then we're working together, looking at it together and building things together. The other thing is I'm very clear. You, you've got to be really, this is the, the biggest advice to artists is just to be really clear about what you want, you know, what the numbers are, what uh, your consignment agreement, your loan agreement that all of those parameters are covered um, before you go in, in into a, a situation where you're going to be exhibiting some with at a space. So Definitely. you really want to know 
you know, is, is there an artist fee? Is there production expenses? Is there shipping? What do you need in the contract? You know, is this through a gallery or you work, are you working with my gallery? Um, so that all of those things are super crystal clear when you're stepping in that there's no, okay, suddenly you're in the space and, and things are not as you had thought that they would be. So I guess that, that, best piece of advice is do your advice is just, you know, do your, do your homework and make sure that, that you've got yourself covered, you know, make sure you know what your artwork, um, you know, take care of your artwork, make sure it's inventoried, make sure you have your information, make sure you have your images, make sure that you're organized on your end and that will better serve you in the end. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that that personal and professional preparation on the artist end can really protect them in the long run and be able to uh, create and foster a much more positive experience across yeah. the board. Mm -hmm. Oh, just in the sense, like if you, you know, if you have something, I've had artwork show up so beautifully wrapped and so well lovingly taken care of that it's made a statement on who that artist is. And then I've taken pains to ensure that it's in that same state. So if you are taking the time to take care of yourself, that definitely comes across. And then those people will, will immediately want to take care of you in that same method. Yeah, it does create a very substantial impression on the organization that that kind of artist is, is working with. And I think that it probably creates a lot of trust between the curator and the organization and the artist. They get to look at that artist as a professional and then take care of them accordingly. Yeah. So what sort of advice would you give to very, very young artists, um, either you know at the very early stages of their careers or just coming out of art school? How can they go about getting in contact with galleries and museums? Do you have any best practices that you can recommend to them to launch them you know, into, the, into the right space? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, I, I feel like I've been asked this question countless times. So many times over the years. <laughs> and, um, and I've honed in my advice on it. If you're just fresh coming out and you're getting, you know, you finish school and you've got a beautiful portfolio that you put together, I would say the most important aspect in the art world, because the art world's actually a pretty small place, just think about relationships and the way that you're going to develop relationships with people. As you're reaching out to people, you really want to get to know them and have a personal level and know what their interests are. So sending out like a blanket email, mm -hmm. you know, to me is, you know, it's effective. I, I get it. I look at it. I look at everything that comes across my screen if somebody's submitting something. But if somebody is, you know, at an opening and introducing themselves and then following up, you know, if somebody's really making that contact and if they're paying attention to the kind of shows that we're doing, they're going to get so much further. And so if you, you know, really look at the people that you're trying to connect with, do the research of the kind of work that they're showing, you know, I've had people apply and, and, and you just kind of think, you know, they send these submissions and they're not really thinking about where they're sending it to. They're just sending it thinking, well, if I cast more like a wider net, I would get more chances when in actuality it, you know, I think that's great. But if you are actually paying attention to where, to where you want your work to be shown and to, to why specifically that space would be good for you, you'll get much further. So for example, when I was in New York working at those galleries, I worked at three different galleries and they had very different kinds of programming. Um, right. They had the, the people that ran each gallery had a very specific vision. So you would want to look at that gallery, you know, like take a look. I want to think of a good example, but like I use David's Warner a lot because it's a very large, very well-known gallery. So if you want to take a look at David Warner, you know, you go to the website, circle through the artists, think about how your art would fit within that oeuvre, like how it would work within that programming. So um, if you don't see it fit, if your work is, you know, just wild and crazy and, you know, and it doesn't quite fit there, then go to another gallery and say you go to Jeffrey Deitch, mm -hmm. you know, so Jeffrey Deitch is a totally right. different gallery, totally different type of programming than what you would see at Swarmer. So you go to Jeffrey Deitch and ah, my work fits 
this kind of programming. So you send an email, I see your roster of artists, I think my work falls in line with such and such and such and such. Looking at that, I think my work would be a really nice addition into your programming, and I would love an opportunity for you to do a studio visit. And so that would be your first. And then you can go go to an, go to an opening or stop by the gallery or just, you know, really start making a presence and start to try to engage in a relationship, you know, try to develop a relationship with these different galleries. I can't say enough, like how important it is to go to openings, to do studio visits. Absolutely. With other artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the most successful things I ever, I, I, I do see is when artists create their own organization, when they work together, when they support each other, that's a very successful means of getting, getting attention and getting your work out there is that say you have a shared studio space with like three other artists, you guys can have open studios, you can have a space that becomes an exhibition space where you're doing your own programming, you're promoting each other. Uh, if you have a curator coming to visit one artist, you ask the curator if they want to visit everybody. You know, like you you open that door mm -hmm. by just a, more opportunities for people to pass through in that way as well. Yeah, that's like main advice. And then, yeah, and then your website, I, you know, has got to be, it's really got to have the information that you have in your work. It's got to have images and it's got to be easy to move through because if you're going to be sending a submission, you know, you want that click of a button to be very flawless and smooth and engaging and and very easy to navigate. So those are my three. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that it is really important to bring up that point of considering the institution to which you're presenting your work. I think that there are a lot of challenges too that specific galleries and museums face that maybe artists don't often take into account when it's when it's really there on a very surface level, you know? So if you're proposing a show with an organization that's governed by a very strict board or is maybe affiliated with a government entity or something like that, the chances of them showing work that has, you know, heavily violent imagery or gets into tricky um, political territory that's just really on the nose and very overt, I mean, it's highly unlikely to be picked up by those sorts of organizations. But if you work within an independently run gallery or maybe some um, artist owned spaces, they have so much more flexibility. So I think having a lot of common sense about where you direct your effort, it's gonna make that much more fruitful across mm -hmm. the board. Yeah. I've seen so many artists just display a whole lot of goodwill. You know, if you're an artist and you go to an opening of your own work or a group show that features your own work, but you invite a couple of your artist friends and colleagues and introduce them to the curator, I feel like as a curator, I actually really do pay attention to those artists. Yeah, great point. I feel like that certainly, I, you know, when I had a, I had a gallery that I was running in Mexico when I was in Mexico and, you know, we really wanted it to feel like a family and mm -hmm. the family, you know, just, it was all about promoting each other. So it wasn't even, it was like working with an artist that was, it wasn't just me making the introductions, but the artist was making the introductions for me as well to open up the path for the other artists, you know? So you're really saying we're a part of this, you know, small family here, you should be looking at all of us because the programming is there. So exactly to your point, you know, if you are making connections, not just for yourself, but for, for the people that are around you, it's going to fold back onto yourself. Definitely. It's small. It's a small, small art world. I've been working with people on and off over the years, and it's just been so delightful to suddenly cross paths again. You know, it's the it, that's the best, the best part of all of it, you know, or you go to an art fair and suddenly you're seeing people that you've known for, you know, I've known them for 15 years. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Well, I think that this, this uh, warmth that I hear from you, this love for relationships and really helping people grow and doing what you can to make it possible for good things to happen, you know, in, both in your life and then in the lives of all of these artists and their peers. I think that a lot of that 
is very evident um, in these multidisciplinary shows, very collaborative shows that you've put on um, throughout your career. And one of the things that I, I want to specifically highlight is your Site 95 project. So I'd love for you to just describe the inception and the premise of Site 95. How did it come to be? And then I'd love to get into like the less artistic more kind of gritty nuts and bolts of the sort of undertaking. So why don't we start out with with how Site 95 was born, and then we'll get into what it takes to create shows and facilitate this, this type of experience for our community. Yeah, my pleasure. It was really inspired from my gallery work. I worked with an artist, Jeffrey Farmer, who worked site specifically, where he literally would arrive with elements and then install on site And so for me to be working with people like that really just opened doors for me. And I found it to be surprisingly easy uh, to be able to find these opportunities. So Mm. I encourage people to really just just go out and try. You know, you you feel limited because it's something you've never done before. But in actuality, it, it is very much possible. And so once you start doing it, once you start making those steps, just more and more doors open in that path. So... With Sign 95, I wanted to create at, you know, at the time there were a lot of open, empty spaces. And so I did this one exhibition called Dead in August, mm-hmm. where, you know, in New York, everybody tends to leave uh, for the summer. And the one month in particular, it used to be just tumbleweed in the city. It's not as much anymore, although right. now with the pandemic it is, but in it's those- a fantastic title. <laughs> Yeah, dead in August. Everything, <laughs> yeah, everything was dead in August. And yet I was able to locate many, many spaces to create this series of projects. And so I did these multi venue projects. I had a gallery space, I had a warehouse, the steamship, a lot of public outdoor uh, venues that I was able to utilize during that period. It really enabled me to expand and, and off that idea of working site specific. Um, and being able to work in an unconventional space. So that that was the premise. I mean, I just started talking to people, finding out spaces that I could use. You know, there nobody was really using the spaces in the middle of August. So a lot of people were like, sure, you know, like go for it. And so I was able to develop a lot of programming through that way. And then that just yeah, more and more doors opened. I came down to Miami and uh, met with several real estate people that that were very open to the idea of a temporary exhibition. And I was able to make exhibitions on, you know, relatively low budgets and just be able to do it just to make it happen. So now, did you have any kind of, um, did you have grants that helped to fund these projects or were they personally funded? How, how do you go about... Um, actually producing something like this, even with a low budget? Again, um, you know, there were, there were some things when I, you know, when I did my first project out of New York, that was just shoestring budget. It was Mm -hmm. me with a car and just making the show, you know, and then once I was making more connections, we would be able to do these fundraisers. Again, I have a history of gallery work. So I, I already knew like a wealth of artists in New York. So there was a lot of trust. The artists trusted me to be able to be respectful of their work, to, to install the work, to watch the work, to take care of it. And so I already kind of had that, which were, you know, which was really wonderful. And then, you know, working with some galleries that I already knew. So again, it, it, it all goes back to these personal relationships where yeah, you're like, relationships. This is something, yeah, so something I'm thinking of doing. And, you know, and then this person's like, yes, we have this space available. We would love for you to use it during this time. You know, it's, we'll cross promote and you can do it pretty, you would be surprised how inexpensive it can be. And then as it grew, I did get the 501c3 and I applied for grants. I got a great community grant in New York for a dead in August uh, through the city. Here in Miami, I got a city grant through Miami Dade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some foundations. I actually um, was able to get a lot 
lot of projects covered that way. But it's definitely a struggle. I'm, I'm not going to like sugarcoat. It was hard. <laughs> but it was at least I, I usually was able to get things paid for. A lot of times I was able to get artist fees or at least help with the production. There were things that we were able to do to make the exhibition come to fruition. So that was really great. And I miss it. I still do some projects through Site95, but it's, it's just been elongated out with my other work. So along with the topic of Site95 um, comes the idea of creating exhibitions in unconventional spaces. I would love for you to tell our listeners about Lilac and just let, let us know how it evolved and some of the intricacies involved with creating such an unusual exhibition. That was, uh, that was such a fun experience. You know, I had been approached by that point. I, I, was, in, I was interviewed in a magazine. There was like, or it was like... It was the New York Times did an article about curators having to wear different hats um, that you really needed to have these different jobs Mm -hmm. and different things kind of going on in order to um, to be able to continue with your curatorial career. So the director of the Lilac had actually reached out to me because I was talking about you know this the importance of being flexible and being fluid um, to be able to try to do as many different things as possible. And so she had reached out to me and it was just, I mean, such a wonderful, wonderful challenge. You know, I would work with the artists in kind of designating these different rooms to people and then helping them figure out how to work within the parameters of the ship. So there were things like, you know, obviously no air conditioning and it was the middle of the summer. So, right. you know, painting um, may not be the best, you know, it was... <laughs> Trying to figure out. So, you know, I worked with Colette Robbins, who's this incredible painter. So she actually had her drawings transferred to these adhesives and that went through the porthole windows, like these little circular windows, so that when you're peering through the window, these imagined landscapes are created. And so this was the first time she had ever done something like that. And so it's a great example how when you have parameters and when you're working with, you know, these restrictive ways, um, how it can open new doors. And so she was learning a lot about printing. Um, She collaborates a lot with printmakers up there. So you know, it was just a wonderful opportunity for her to be able to think about the way that her work can be produced in a different manner other than than fine art painting. So that's one example. And then there was there was a number of artists that worked very fluidly within the space to create new pieces. You know, we had um, Chad Stayrook did this really great lighthouse installation. It was totally inspired by the lilac, totally from researching about the lilac. And then he did a performance with a harpist, uh, Shelley Bergen. And so, you know, these different pieces came together through people working within these different parameters, you know. And so I just kind of laid out this floor plan and then helped them realize what they were envisioning, which was so fun. So, so fun. Um, Some of the pieces were already made or factored in and so I was like thinking of ways like video projection you could do things like video projection or video installation we worked with Nama Sabar and Jordan Rathis on pieces that would fit that were already made but that would work very well within context of the ship um, we also organized the electricity was not on all the time oh wow so, really we, yeah um, <laughs> So, yeah. And then, oh, and then also the incredible banners and sales and things that we had with fort makers. Um, I had come across them through just researching their work with what they did with PS1. I mean, Mm -hmm. I had just been kind of looking and thinking about the outdoor pieces they were doing for PS1 and they were wonderful. And then, so they saw the ship and then it was just this really wonderful way of like, well, of course we should be making sales, you know? And so (laughs) they made these beautiful streamers and, and just did everything in a site specific way. They brought all the materials and everything got built you know, in situ. And then we did performances. We had a film screening, a screening night. And so that's where we could have that electricity. And so we did uh, the film night with sound performances. We had uh, a lot of children activities. We did like uh, kid activities on the boat. Um, There was a playground just nearby. So that was actually a really nice event for kids to be making their own sailboats. And uh, yeah, it just was a very you know, you have this opportunity and you find out, okay, there's, there's no AC, there's, you know, 
areas that are going to get wet. Um, there's, you know, times it's not going to have power. How do you create something that's really thoughtful to the ship itself and using the history of the ship itself? Right. So. Well, and those constraints that you were just speaking about, if that was in a traditional gallery setting, it would be catastrophic. It wouldn't even be a gallery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to hear you talk about these things that were just, you know, maybe just, they were not, not even inconveniences. They were just things you had to take into account. It really shows, um, you know, how much you've, you've pushed the boundaries of what an exhibition space can be and how receptive you are to alternative suggestions and locations. What kind of feedback and responses did you get from visitors and members of the public that came to this show? From those, that, that was a really, really well attended. I was so happy with that. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I've had some exhibitions where I've had like two people show up. Yes. You know, <laughs> You know, that happens, but this was packed. And, you know, part of it, you know, part of doing the dead in August is that it is like all of us are, we're still there. A lot mm -hmm. of people are still there over the summers, barbecuing, painting, working. And so those were well attended mainly because it was a group show with what, 12, 15 artists. So they were spreading the word and it was very local. So New York just, you know, they were paying attention. And then also the timing of it, because there aren't many other exhibitions, we actually got a lot of great press and we had press people attend the openings because, sure. yeah, they actually attended the events because there weren't many conflicting um, events happening at the same time. So there was a lot of things in there where we were making something happen out of, out of very little that just really kind of turned inward and like, and then outward. So a lot of people were spreading the word. The parties were really fun and exciting. And the performances were just, you know, there was one piece, uh, Byron uh, Westbrook did this beautiful sound piece where people walked around with speakers. And so it became this beautiful exchange. And so I think, yeah, I think that exhibition in, in particular was, was a really great success, um, mostly because you know, so many people were involved in it. Well, on the topic of, of programming and ways to actually have people be involved with what they're seeing, I would love to talk to you about art education, um, workshops, and especially getting children involved with, um, with art, particularly contemporary art, which can for a lot of people seem um, sort of exclusive. So could you tell me about how you go about planning um, art education components for children and why is this a priority for you? Well, it's always the first thing to go, right? It's mm -hmm. always the first thing to go. Always. Um, in every, every scenario. I, I'm really lucky right now that I'm working with a really wonderful staff. The Department of Education here is incredible. There's a brand new director that started just a few months before me, Amanda Smith. And she's just got incredible energy. The building, we're getting a new education building that's going to house, be able to house more students. The programming is going to expand. So I have to say in the particular it, circumstance I'm in now, I'm very, very excited because it's, I'm, I'm learning. It's an opportunity to take, you know, my exhibitions to another level. And so my focus since I've been here is how to make my exhibitions more accessible and understandable for the general public and how education can come as a role to people that come through that are, you know, just visiting that don't really go to a lot of art institutions um, and to help them understand contemporary art because contemporary art can be really complicated or, or just very complex and dense and just not clear. Yeah, so, visitors often feel like they're, they're left out of the conversation. So yeah. that stops them from taking a step in and from even like yeah. starting to investigate. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I have this, I have this whole, you know, when I was at Casey Kaplan, it was like, you know, four years of me working in this like conceptual and in Andrea Rosen of working with conceptual artists, which I love, I love, love, love conceptual art. But, you know, it takes, it takes a while for people to lean into it and to understand it and to like it and to, and to really want to engage with it. So, you know, that's, I'm trying to think of how it can be more accessible and how that information can be more accessible. 
this is a very community driven um, space. The education is, is a really strong component here. So I'm excited to see how my exhibitions, you know, with the summer show alone, like how it can be translatable um, for people to experience contemporary art and to, and to engage with it and not feel like they're just walking into like an, a gallery and that there's not enough information and that they're just gonna walk out, so. Absolutely. I think yeah. that is so important. Why yeah. don't you go ahead and, and tell our listeners what your theme for the summer is? Ah, right. Yeah. And so the summer exhibition is Time to Play. Um, the programming, I had stepped in and there was some programming that had already been laid out. And so this was an exhibition that had already been kind of like the outline was there. And then I've been, you know, moving to, uh, to, to, really develop the exhibition under this, this theme. And so it's actually changed a little bit since, since I began here, but it's, you know, one of the things that I'm focused on is creating a group exhibition that is lively, that is engaging, um, that makes people excited to come. I mean, you don't have a show called time to play and then, you know, <laughs> right. people are bored, you know? <laughs> so it's like, how can we make this interesting? And then working with contemporary artists. Um, I also want to always push uh, local art to a national level. So we're working with some local art artists here, but then placing them with national artists so that there's a level um, playing field that, that it creates um, possibilities for these artists to show their show their work out, outside of the area. Um, so when you're making these exhibitions, it's good to like kind of make these different combinations um, so that it, you know, spreads like a web. And um, so I'm very, very lucky to be working with uh, Leo Castaneda, who does uh, video gaming, paintings, projections. Oh, are fabulous. Very interesting artist, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so he'll be doing, he's working on finishing a new video. And then Samuel Lopez de Victoria is a brilliant example of somebody that knows how to, to translate. And, and uh, Jen Clay also, both of them are incredible artists that know how to translate contemporary art to, to the general public. They know how to make work um, that's very engaging. So Jen's gonna be doing this wonderful immersive installation in our middle gallery based on you know work that she's been making um, with pulleys and all sorts of fun wild uh, fantastical creatures <laughs> and then Samuel Lopez de Victoria is going to be making this working on video gaming and so we're making the work accessible we're making it you know making the exhibition safe so people can come and see and be able to experience it and so that, that's what those artists are working on. And then we have work coming from New York and Boston. The New Craft Artists Alliance is an organization that NCAA is an organization that does uh, hand knit uh, basketball hoops. So we're gonna have, uh, I'm essentially flipping the main gallery into a, a playground, like an outdoor play area. There's gonna be a big beautiful bonsai tree by Chris Bogia that talks about building blocks and, and how we structure and balance uh, objects in, in space and in our own physical space. And then there'll be these incredible basketball hoops. Um, there's going to be a, a Froebel block inspired painter, Sophia Sch uh, Schwager, who's uh, based in London. And so, you know, if you're not sure what the Froebel blocks are, those are the they, those were developed in, in the uh, 1920s, 1930s, the early days of kinder development, mm -hmm. where there are these Froebel blocks were created uh, for children at a young age to learn. And so she's done a series of paintings um, that are these Froebel block paintings that are just beautiful. Um, so there's going to be, a, and then we have this last but not least, did I get everybody? Last but not least, there's Nathan Sawaya, who does a uh, Lego um, brick inspired sculptures and so we have a basketball a lego basketball hoop and we are inviting people to do the acch brick art challenge where they can do their own constructions their own lego constructions out of their imagination and post them online and at the end of the summer we're going to announce a winner 
that'll get a free membership, uh, not just to the center, but a friends level membership that'll allow access to, to over a thousand museums nationwide. So that's what we're doing. I, you know, I get excited as I'm talking about it because it's so just bright and lively and, and just such a different combination of ways of thinking about play and, and where the education comes from. Yeah, and particularly necessary at this time. Um, for anyone who is interested um, in visiting this show, and everyone should definitely go, um, be sure to check out artandculturecenter.org just to check the times that the center will be open, um, whether there are any restrictions in place, and you can definitely contact them um, directly to find out um, how to visit uh, the exhibition and get engaged. You know, so we talked a bit about your work in the past, what kind of brought you to this point. We've taken a look at your summer exhibition that's coming up and then, you know, started down this path of the artists that you're working with here. Um, with that in mind, New York remains a worldwide epicenter for the arts. And after all of the work that you've done there, what drew you to South Florida? Hmm. I think I was, you know, I had already been thinking about being down here just because I was so, you know, from the nonprofit, from Site95, when I was coming down here, it was so open to my ideas and really receptive in terms of space and art. Um, so I've been coming up, I mean, first of all, I've been coming up and down here since I was a kid. You know, I have family that lived down here. So it wasn't a very foreign place uh, for me at all. Um, it already felt like home in many ways. But it, it just, in, the, in terms of art, it is like a really great community of people that really show up to each other's openings. They are very encouraging of each other. The promoting and, and collaboration between everyone is so lively. And so it, it, it just felt like a very natural shift for me. Um, I do miss New York. Mm -hmm. um, I do, but... Uh, I don't know. It's just not, it's not right for me right now. And I love that I still get to work with, with many people up there. Um, you know, again, I'm doing a collaboration with this gallery where they're, you know, we're shipping this work down. And so I get to work with somebody that actually used to work with me at Site 95. So, you know, those relationships are all still there and I still go to New York pretty pretty regularly and we'll get back up there as soon as as soon as I can so none of it ever really changes it's just I felt that this place in particular there was a lot that I can do there was a lot of opportunities for me and the artists that are around me and to really um and to really like dive into it yeah I think that's incredibly well said um there are so many major cities around the country where the art world and community in that particular space is relatively closed. If you don't have a foot in the door or you don't know the right person, it can be so hard to break in. And what you're describing is completely true. South Florida right now is having a moment in art and culture where it is so open and so ready to embrace new ideas and perspectives. And it, it sort of ties us to what you were discussing earlier on about elevating local mid-career and established artists to a national level by bringing in artists from other states. You know, the second we get too um, insular and we just sort of rotate within our own circles too much, we stop learning. And so I'm sure that someone with your experience and your relationships and connections, you're really going to be able to um, elevate and uplift this cultural environment by bringing um, creative makers from around the country in um, and, and forging those ties, you know, lifting everyone up through that. So New York hasn't left you. You're just bringing it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a nice way to think about it. Yeah, it, it hasn't. And I think this, it's new for me to be this north of Florida. And so, I, you know, you and I, I would love to speak with you more about being in Pembroke Pines. But, you know, there's a lot of people kind of shifting and, and living up here. There was a lot of artists that I didn't know up here. So it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to delve into another aspect that I wasn't aware of before. So yeah, it's a good time. And this city has got a lot of opportunities for artists. There's a lot of funding. There's a lot of support. Um, there's a lot of direct relationships between, you know, independent curators and institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good place to be for artists. I really do. In many ways, better than New York, because New York is just such a, 
you know, it's hard to, with the competition, just with the number of people and trying to get things out here, this, this is smaller and you really can go to everybody's openings. You can be able to connect with people, um, which I think is really, really great. Yes, you absolutely can. It's, it's a, it's an amazing place too, for someone, you know, for, for an artist or creative to be able to come out and actually develop their resume. If they're, um, if they're trustworthy and professional, as you said before, um, the the opportunities are there for the taking, and um, it's it's a really you know fertile moment for people to be able to get a ton of shows on their resume, lectures, workshop experience, and use that as as you know a, a scaffolding platform if they do want to move to other cities down the line as well. Yeah. All right. Let's do a couple of just for fun questions, and then I I'm going to let you go because I know you have a lot to plan. All right, uh, lightning round. What music are you listening to these days? You know, I just was making my pandemic uh, coronavirus playlist <laughs> for people. So funny. Yola, my goodness. Uh, Yola's been a wonderful new discovery for me. Um, but I've also been listening to some stuff that I've, I've already had. Like, uh, for some reason, I Cat Stevens and Jim Croce. Oh, um, I've been listening to a lot of them that because I just it's been a very long time since I've been listening to them. Um, the Fiona Apple uh, new album that came out. Have you heard it? I have not heard it. Woo! It is. <laughs> Woo! Adding Maybe it to my list. You gotta listen to it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I have been listening to to a lot of music lately, and and that's been. I mean, I normally do, but. I feel like I've been listening to the same music over and over again. So the last couple of weeks, I felt like I kind of broke out and was listening to more stuff, which is, which has been really great. And then I've been reading too. Oh, this is a lightning round. I'm, I'm talking too long, um, but I've been reading too. <laughs> no, I love I it. Keep going. The stories. And I just finished visual intelligence, which was, you know, two books that have been sitting on my nightstand for a long time. And I got about halfway through them. And then I just was able to finish them. So now I'm excited to start another, you know, starting another book as well. And yeah, books on tape, podcasts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. When you are not working on curatorial projects, how do you like to spend your free time? I run. I run a lot. I'm a long distance runner. Oh, wow. Yes. I've run uh, five marathons in my in the last, what? eight years. Oh my God. And I did my first triathlon last year. So yeah, I really, really love running. I would say my ideal day is, is going for a run, reading a book. I have two kids and so they are uh, turning six, turning eight. And so we party a lot together. They're hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but yeah. So when I have spare time, when I'm, when I'm not, you know, doing stuff with them, activities with them, I'm usually reading or yeah, I mean, the, the general kind of stuff we're all doing. Netflix, right. you know. Netflix. You <laughs> um, Miss Fisher, the, the mysteries of Miss Fisher has been great. Ozark, yeah, some things like that. But it's, I, I'd say this last two months has been great because I've been able to really get my long distance running game back in gear and I've been able to read more. And, and those two things are just so wonderful for your, for your mind, so... Yeah, I, I think that um, for those of us who are lucky and um, our health is intact and we're really just negotiating sort of the inconveniences of the coronavirus rather than the life-threatening, um, you know, factors that it's, that it's brought into play for the whole world, um, this has been a time where people can start, they can like reboot, you know, and um, if you as, you know, a full-time working professional and, and a mother and someone with her own personal interests, like if you can um, realign your priorities in a way that, that you really want to see them, um, you know, take, take effect in your life, I think that, I think that we all can. And it's mm. very easy to pick up your, your phone or an iPad rather than picking up a book. But I think that this time that people have had at home has like gotten them screened out and actually like putting their phones down and looking for other, you know, other things um, to, to, to enrich their lives. And if anything, I think that that's a huge, uh, a huge benefit um, for all of us. Yeah. You know, you're so right. I just, that is it's probably exactly why I go to bed and I'm like, I don't need to watch something right now. Cause I've been sitting in front of the screen all day and all why, day. 
the physical comfort of holding a book is so great, you mm-hmm. know, that just being able to have something that removes you from that screen, that bright screen. That's so true. That's probably why, you know, I have this attitude that I think is something that I've been talking about just the way with the way that, you know, you, that I make exhibitions is that, you know, you have parameters, you have things that prevent you from doing certain things. So you have to think about what can you do? What, how can you grow out of that? What are you allowed to do? Um, So within these circumstances, you know, with my kids, you know, it's like, well, what are we able to do and really making the most out of that? And, you know, and that, you know, it ties in with exhibition making. You're like, well, what can we do when we have so much money and we can't ship and we can't, you know, all of these different parameters come into play. And then you end up being able to build something really great from that. Yeah, definitely. It's, it is easy to focus on the restrictions, but um, from our conversation today, I really feel as though you're someone who, um, you maybe acknowledge the restrictions, but then you seek out the opportunities that exist between them. And what a tremendous motto for life, uh, one that you're, one that you're implementing in your personal time. Um, but I cannot wait to see um, what you do in your new role um, at the Art and Culture Center um, Hollywood here in Florida. We're so so lucky to have you, um, and I will definitely be uh, updating people. I'll be sure to, um, to link to your website and make it so that everyone can benefit from the, the, the beauty and the cultural enrichment that, um, that you're gonna bring right to us in our neighborhood. So thank you, Megan. Thank you, so kind. I can't wait to meet you in person. <laughs> Me too. Hopefully it will be mask free and yeah. um, maybe even involve a hug. We'll see, we'll see what the CDC says. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay, take care.